And welcome to Computer Science E75. This is Lecture 7 JavaScript. So it's today and next week where we finally start to come full circle with a number of topics we've been talking about for some time, among them XML and DOM, which we saw earlier in the semester. And these will particularly recur as we move in the weeks to come to AJAX and really the culmination of the course where you'll have Project 3, your own Google mashup. Um, so along those lines, I actually, somewhat on a whim, uh, foolish or otherwise, sat down on Thursday night to redo map.harvard.edu. So map.harvard.edu is Harvard, uh, Harvard's canonical site for finding places on campus. We ourselves linked to this in the course's syllabus for that first class when you all had to find Harvard Hall, if unfamiliar. And so we linked to what's a fairly retro version of Harvard's map, certainly useful, but you can kind of zoom in on the map here and then you can kind of sort of old school map school style, go up, down, left, right, and finally hone in on, say, the Charles Hotel. And then you can make your way up to Harvard Yard. And I think that's the page that we link to on the course's website. So technology has certainly advanced since then. And this seemed to me some very low hanging fruit. In fact, in um, with one of the courses I teach last fall, we had a number of students for their final projects work on something precisely like this. I mean, most of us in this room probably use Google Maps these days, and Google has very kindly made it very easy to integrate with their maps, um, their own maps. And so what I sat down to do was take Harvard's data set on all of its 600 or so buildings and their GPS coordinates of all of that and see what I could do so that we could actually make a site that integrates precisely this stuff we're going to be talking about this week. So among the the, I will say, sexy features that this version sports uh, is, for instance, some very simple auto-completion. You start searching for science, and it immediately triggers a list of the available science-related options. Notice even uh, ever so subtly highlighting the, the part of the substring that's been matched. If you're a true geek, right, these are the kinds of things you probably delight in as well, especially when you see it working for the first time. Go ahead and search, you get a little ajax -y progress bar, then all of a sudden the left-hand side of the page changes. We, of course, have our CS50 from my fall course's watermark up there. And then voila, there's the Science Center. And in fact, thanks to Harvard's planning office, which was kindly kind enough to provide me with all of the data, really a big XML file and a big tech, uh, tab delimited file uh, with all of the building names and ID numbers and all of the coordinates of the polygons that represent the buildings, you'll notice that even though this is a typical generic Google map here, it, the site has actually trace the outline in a little gray ink of exactly what the Science Center looks like, including all those little nuances and such. Unfortunately, those little nuances are not computationally cheap to render client-side, and I spent probably three or four hours implementing one of the first of what I called special features. Um, when, then I very quickly added the labels beta, since they didn't work very well. But four hours later, I did have these two features working, building footprints, so you could see all of the footprints on campus, because that would be kind of neat. You can actually see where Harvard lives within the uh, confines of Cambridge here. And then also building labels. But let me go ahead and click on building footprints here, which my mom has already reported as not functioning on Internet Explorer 6 back home on her connection. Um, the browser simply times out because the script takes so long to run. I have a decent computer here. But um, it was not immediate, as you may have noticed there. But it's kind of sexy. I mean, I actually think this is really neat, just how relatively easy it was to just take a big XML file that just had a bunch of comma-separated um, XY coordinates, or latitude, longitudinal coordinates, that I was then able to tell Google, go start drawing points like this. And then when you reach the last one, fill it all in, in whatever color I chose. Um, unfortunately, labels don't work out quite as well. I'm not going to make Chrome display both of them, so let me go ahead and turn those off. Getting rid of them is much easier than actually rendering 600 things. Um, building names, this was a fun one to see for the first time. So, <laughs> similarly not that useful. And so as naive as I was initially thinking, wow, I'm going to totally kick the ass of map.harvard.edu and make a better looking version. Like This is kind of what happens when you don't have a human exercising a little bit of judgment in like Adobe Illustrator or whatever they use to mark up the campus map. So fortunately, they did give me an actual campus map um, which looks like what you see on the back of the phone book if you're a Harvard affiliate and such. And so this was a fun element as well. So now I'm still doing the highlighting, at least of the particular search result. I can go ahead and get rid of that here. But you'll notice that this world is not quite as big 
as the rest of the world. In fact, that you'll notice the scroll bar perhaps, or the zoom bar, is not as large because I realized it's kind of pointless to browse Harvard's campus from 20,000 feet in the air. Um, so there's really nothing more going on there. But this was an image that they provided me with. And they very nicely gave me the latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates of the top left and the bottom right corners, which was enough then for me to figure out after, again, another four hours, how to scale it properly to overlay it on Google Maps. But the interesting thing, if you haven't quite thought about it yet or haven't looked closely, is that Google Maps are made up of thousands of little tiles, so to speak. And each of these tiles is generally a ping, PNG file, that's 256 pixels by 256 pixels. And they do this so that you can dynamically render the map. Sometimes you might have noticed this if you click and drag on a Google Map, then very quickly those squares fill in. So the catch is that if you want to implement your own overlay like this, you need to implement those tiles. Now, they had just given me a big PDF file, which kind of scared me at first, because I didn't know how I was even going to convert that to a ping. Turns out Acrobat has a save as ping option, so that eliminated one uh, design problem in this, in this picture. But I did that. I did a little cropping. And then essentially, after a bit of arithmetic, figured out how to map um, the GPS coordinates of this map onto the XY pixel locations that Google actually uses to place images on the map. Now, the only catch is that what you're looking at now is a different set of tiles than this one, which is a different set of tiles than this one, which is a different set of tiles than this one, and this one, and this one. And now you can actually see the tiles rendering a bit slowly on this connection. So long story short, I, like anyone implementing this kind of overlay, had to figure out how to chop up this ping not only into tiles, but into tiles at all different zoom levels, effectively zooming in on the image, chopping, zooming in on the image, chopping, and so forth. Thankfully, there's some nice people out there who struggled with this before I had to, um, wrote a, some scripts that facilitated this, but only after a lot of hoop jumping. So what you'll find in project three in the course, that the APIs are wonderful for what they let you do. But there are still some pieces that require a bit more uh, ingenuity. But fortunately, some other folks have forged the head certainly long before I did. But it's rather neat. And the motivation for bringing this up tonight is, again, if I'm searching, say, for my old dorm, Mather House, well, what this will do is use JavaScript, ultimately, to do all of this rendering. And so this is where I think this language, JavaScript, has really really sort of begun to take off, particularly in the context of these APIs. It wasn't that long ago where JavaScript, if you used it, was really for stupid things, right? Like creating fairly annoying alerts, creating the pop-up uh, ads of yesteryear, which thankfully have largely gone away. But now they're just getting more sophisticated with, ironically, more JavaScript tricks. Um, but you can start to do really interesting things. And so we're not, we won't in this course certainly dissect JavaScript in its entirety, but empower you to do enough with it so that after the course, you have a sense of what you can do with this and with the related APIs that exist, but also so that hopefully you have a taste of where web development is likely to continue going for some time. Since these applications that all of us are now using, this one included, as well as the actual Google Maps software, are using a technology called Ajax, which once upon a time stood for yeah, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. So the asynchronous there means that you can ask the website to do something. It will go do it and get back to you when it's complete. So there's less waiting for the website to uh, respond, at least aesthetically. We'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Uh, asynchronous JavaScript is just the language that you use to interact with AJAX applications. Uh, and is an easy one. And XML is kind of a white lie these days. You can use XML as the underlying transport mechanism for requesting more data from the server. And that's what, again, makes these applications dynamic. The fact that I'm clicking and dragging, and there's nothing there yet, but if I give the browser enough time, it goes and gets more data. That data could be fetched in the form of XML somehow. But these days, other formats altogether are um, popular, including JSON. So JavaScript object notation is another even um, more efficient mechanism we'll see for marshalling data back and forth. So it's a really exciting time, I think. And frankly, it's mashups like this and it's APIs like Google's. And there's certainly other companies that have similarly made fun data sets and fun APIs available that, at least for me, has sort of restored the fun that I originally had in programming. Because with much less effort and with much less um, groundbreak, um, sort of foundation building code, can you get something really neat? up and running. In fact, I sat down on Thursday night, maybe at 6 PM, was sort of sufficiently inspired. And by midnight, by bedtime, I had something working. It didn't do all of this. But I at least had the search feature working, which I felt, actually, no, slight, slight white lie. 
I had the autocomplete feature working. So it could autocomplete your searches and just hit enter, it doesn't take you anywhere. But that was sort of a nice milestone. Um, and for me, I'm certainly enjoying this more and more. And what we'll probably talk about also in the context of JavaScript in some time is the companion site to this that's uh, now been released as part of this uh, set of CS50 apps, as we now call them. So this is an event aggregator. Um, similarly, that integrates pretty much everything that this course touches upon in some form. It's using PHP in the back end, MySQL in the back end. Uh, it's using JavaScript and Ajax in the front end. And it's an aggregator in the sense that this is not meant, um, unlike a prior version of this particular tool for campus, to be a place where people go and manually input events. But rather, if you already have a calendar for your student group or for your department on campus, uh, using Google Calendar, using my.harvard.edu, using CSV files, or any kind of proprietary tool that can spit those things out. All it does is, on some automated schedule, is download that information and then make it available to you in this sort of Google Calendar agenda-like format, ideally without any human intervention. And so there's a lot of interesting and frustrating JavaScript coding that goes on underneath the hood of this, not the least of which involves dealing, frankly, with cross-browser incompatibilities. So even as recently as this morning, I realized that I had broken the site for Internet Explorer 6 and 7, because if you're pretty familiar with CSS, you might know that there's this thing called the display property. Uh, the display property can be set to values like none or block, which means don't show this thing or do show this thing. Well. Um, most browsers also support things like display this as though it's a table, as though it's a table row, as though it's a table cell. And this was an amazing discovery on like Saturday when I found this because the way this is working, as you saw me clicking, is it's either showing or hiding various table rows just to create this illusion of drop downs. And it worked great in all browsers. And then I sat down, I decided, all right, we're up and running, it's working. I tried it in IE, it just doesn't work because. <laughs> Microsoft does not support that particular property of table row, table, or table cell, which frankly makes the entire property useless, in my opinion, certainly if you're trying to make anything cross-platform. But I say this now to sort of caution you that sort of part of the package in moving more into web development and certainly trying to make apps that are cross-platform is frankly stupid, stupid headaches like that. And so one of the things we'll do this week and next, though, is try to at least empower you or point you in the direction of some really useful resources that we, the staff, have found helpful, I myself have found helpful, because there's a lot of really nice people out there who have, again, forged the path before us and documented what works and what doesn't work, and had I RTFM to be beforehand, I would have found out that IE did not support the feature I spent two hours implementing that particular day. So there's some fun stuff, but there are bumps in the road. And this is why you'll perhaps appreciate all the more why we don't expect for the projects that they work on all possible browsers, but just two, because that's hopefully enough to give you a taste of a, a bit of frustration. So whether it's CSS, JavaScript, or the like. And it's not just for the sake of being obnoxious. Uh, it's a very sad but uh, real world um, problem posed by trying to code these things um, for various platforms today. Unacceptable solutions, I would say. And there are even some applications at Harvard, some of them, maybe it's something PeopleSoft or something PeopleSoft related, where you have to use Internet Explorer if you want to use this particular tool, which is completely unacceptable. I think whether it's you have to use IE or Firefox. I kind of felt that was a deal breaker if you could visit this site with any browser except Internet Explorer. So it kind of has to go, I think, both ways. So. Fortunately, as time passes, more and more browsers fall by the wayside, but just new incompatibilities arise. So JavaScript. So JavaScript is fundamentally different from most everything we've looked at in this course, at least so far, because it's client side in its execution rather than server side. So we've been looking at PHP, which um, could run on any type of computer, but we've been using it for web apps, and thus it's been running on the server. And so remember that the process by which a web page is served up in a PHP environment is HTTP request comes in, the web server sees it, realizes, oh, this is a .php file. Let me pass this to the PHP interpreter, which is just a binary sitting somewhere on the machine. It does its thing, converting anything between open bracket question mark and the opposite of that to the resulting uh, execution of that code, and then returns to the web server a whole bunch of usually HTML and stuff like that that the web server then says, OK, 
here you go, back to the browser. Now, the fundamental difference with JavaScript is that JavaScript's going to be integrated with the HTML code that's being spit out by the server, or it's just going to be raw files ending in .js. So it's an interpreted language, which means it's human readable, and you'll be able to read it top to bottom, left to right, just like the browser can. But it is sent down the wire just like the HTML code is, just like the GIF uh, images are. Now, the implication of this is that the code does not run on the server. It runs on the client. And this has a number of interesting implications, one of which we've already seen a, a teaser of. And among these implications are what, then? So no script if people have JavaScript disabled, which I would say these days is kind of unreasonable if you're using a normal desktop browser. But you know, for something like your cell phone, which has a limited implementation of a browser, you might not want to break your site to break just because they're using a more limited device. And there are some, I'll say, crazy people out there who disable JavaScript and expect the World Wide Web to work these days. Crazy person in the audience? Corporate environments, too. So there's some other. I mean, the fact of the matter is there's relatively few threats that JavaScript can impose unless it's the browser that itself is buggy, but perhaps a, a topic for another day. But there's a challenge here, too, that if you really want your site to be robust, you want to support uh, graceful degradation, which means it works wonderful if you use a supported browser. Kind of works if you use like the previous version of the browser, and you can at least see something if you're using like Netscape 1, right? So this is a theme of a lot of these things called JavaScript libraries, which we'll also touch on today and next week, which really simplify the process of getting yourself up and running. In fact, I cannot take credit for most of what you see in that Maps program. The autocomplete was implemented for the most part by folks at Yahoo using their free YUI library. The Google Maps part is obviously implemented by Google. And what I really did with my own JavaScript code was kind of piece everything together, the glue that puts it all together. So fortunately, there's not a lot of re-implementation of the wheel um, with this world. We'll see there are, there are many options. Was a hand going back up? Yeah. Perfect. So if you're outsourcing, so to speak, some of the execution of the website's, say, rendering to the browser, you can return response to the user more quickly and let it deal with the rendering. As we'll see over time, you can use JavaScript not just to do silly little things like move elements around on the screen, but you can use it to dynamically generate HTML tags or DOM elements just like you could in PHP. But the implication of being able to do it on the browser means that it's that many fewer bytes that you need to send down the wire. And in fact, one of the motivations for JSON, JavaScript object notation, is that it is very, very lightweight, as we'll see. JSON allows you to send more data from server to client, but without all of the annoying overhead of XML, all of that metadata, all of the open tags, closed tags, JSON does have, we'll see, some uh, parentheses and curly braces and square braces, but fairly minimalist. It's fairly tight. But the problem is you can't just deliver data to your browser and then say, here, user, here's a really cryptic looking string that happened to be very efficiently transmitted to you. You need to now render that data. And so JavaScript's there then used to, say, iterate over the array of additional data that you got, and then dynamically generate more h1 tags, more div tags, more any kinds of tags. Yeah? There's also a small amount where you can't 100% trust JavaScript to do what you told it to do. Because there are tools like Greek Monkey and so forth letting you hack JavaScript behavior on the client side. Yes, so there are also third party tools, whether they're because the person is curious or likes to tinker or just because they're overzealous, say, adware type mechanisms. So, absolutely, if you're trusting more of the pages rendering to the browser, you kind of have to cross fingers perhaps a bit more. And what was the gotcha that even I hinted at when I first clicked that checkbox? Yeah, I mean, this isn't typical, right? It's not often that your app has to render 600 polygons, all of which look like the Science Center on a web page. But clearly, what's a very simple idea just doesn't fly. I mean, the fact that it broke on my mom's computer and had her say, oh, this script wouldn't stop running just because it was slow kind of means now, at least from my perspective, I have to rip the whole feature out or render fewer polygons entirely. So rendering speed, again, becomes an issue, even though, I mean, her machine is a gig, uh, gigahertz, maybe even 1.5 gigahertz. So again, there's inefficiencies in the implementations of JavaScript. So now you're seeing a lot more attention lately, actually, on the performance of various browsers. Chrome 2.0 is touted as being super duper fast, and everyone has their own benchmarks. This is becoming more important, not just for the 
uh, reasons of how long does it take to load this browser once I double click on it, but how long does it take to actually render information, which is increasingly popular. What, what's, um, what are some of the popular Ajax sites that one visits these days besides Google Maps? What's that? Facebook. So Facebook completely overhauled their website a couple months ago now, whereby the whole thing is Ajax driven. The fact that, you know, that you don't have to admit visually that you use Facebook, but <laughs> although I'm friends with some of you now, I know. So um, you, for those of you who have friends who use it, you know that there's that constant overlay in the bottom front of the screen for like the chat window and whatnot. So essentially, as best I can tell, what they're doing now is they download the main page, but then if you watch the URL, almost all of the URLs thereafter have a sharp sign in it, a little fragment ID. And so the whole page is rarely reloading. Rather, they're dynamically fetching more information, essentially another web page, home.php or profile.php. The result's coming back, but then they're inserting it sort of underneath those other layers. And this is how they're getting this appearance of additional dynamism. Um, and it's partly for that chat window reason, I suspect, because you can imagine how relatively annoying it would be if you're trying to use chat, but every time you click a link, which is kind of the purpose of a website, the whole page goes away, you lose the chat transcript, transcript until the whole thing is reloaded again. So that was probably one of the motivations. And it's actually pretty impressive since they are the only website that I know of that is using it to that extent to sort of keep the whole page, the whole site static on some form, but then the rest of the site is dynamic. That's a fairly, sorry? Gmail oh, so Gmail actually does that as well. So, but it's, it's pretty daring and it's actually pretty impressive that it works as well as it does. So there are implications for searches and such since uh, for the most part crawlers are probably tend to be fairly naive these days and can't interact with sites as effectively if a lot of the content is dynamically retrieved. So yes, absolutely that's a problem. For sites to which you have to log in though, probably less of a problem. Gmail and Facebook obviously, um, some examples. So oh, kayak.com, if you've ever, I've stopped using all other search engines for finding airlines and such. Kayak.com is a brilliant, it's a little confusing sometimes, but it's a wonderful use of Ajax. They kind of forged ahead a couple years ago with a really nice UI. So here are some references that we have found useful over time. I lament the fact that I have never found a reference for JavaScript that I find as impressive as, say, PHP's or as impressive as Java's Javadoc. I frankly tend to find myself Googling more often than going to one particular destination, but one canonical place to go is Mozilla's uh, documentation for JavaScript 1.5. Unfortunately, you'll still notice some sort of inconsistencies with various browsers' implementations, but you can at least take some comfort in the fact that that is sort of a, a canon in terms of documentation. Um, there is, uh, if um, the first reference wasn't clear enough, you can then read the reintroduction to JavaScript in what apparently was some kind of rewrite of their original documentation. And then, of course, two of our recommended resources for tutorials, which frankly tend to be a little limited. It's really, really bite-sized snippets. So for this part of the course, especially if you find yourself liking it, I mean, an off-the-shelf book of some sort might be preferable, or just a lot of reading. There's a lot of good uh, resources online. So how do you get this stuff in there? So quick overview of sort of the syntac uh, syntactical details, and then we'll dive into some examples and some actual problems that one can solve with this. So JavaScript can and can be embedded right inside of a web page. So you probably know you can embed CSS right inside of a .html file or .php file in the form of the style tag, which generally belongs in the header or the head element. The uh, script tag, generally written as follows, can also go up in the head tag, but it can also go down later in the page, even within the body tag. In fact, if you use um, uh, Google's uh, Google Analytics to embed snippets of JavaScript code in your website. They essentially use cookies, third-party cookies, to watch the behavior of users on your site uh, or and other tricks uh, as well. Um, they generally they do recommend that you put their stuff, for instance, at the very bottom of your page, right below the closed body tag, because what you'll find now that you start diving into the world of client side and JavaScript rendering is you get some more interesting race conditions, and you get conditions whereby your code might start executing based on where you load it in the page, 
before the whole page has even rendered, so to speak. So you may recall from our discussions of XML that an XML document, and thus XHTML document, can be represented as a tree. And a tree has a root, and then all these descendants, and eventually some leaves. Problem is, if that you're one of those nodes up top is a script element with some JavaScript code that says, go search for these nodes, or go change this node's value, well, if the browser hasn't gotten around to rendering, to creating those nodes at the bottom of the tree yet, just because it needs a little more time, you're going to get JavaScript errors. And you're going to get the little question mark in the bottom of the browser and weird behavior. So one of the first things, for instance, this map program does is it, it uses a little function um, actually that comes from one of these popular JavaScript libraries that says, don't execute any of my code until, quote unquote, the DOM is ready. And essentially what Yahoo does and what a number of these libraries do uh, is um, set a timer. So they check every 200 milliseconds, is the whole DOM ready? Is the whole DOM ready? Is the whole DOM ready? And when finally it is, then they execute your code. But again, this is some of these time-saving techniques using library code often simplifies a lot of the headaches that might often arise, especially ones that are hard to reproduce, as in if the web connection is just slow and that's what's creating the uh, race condition whereby the DOM nodes aren't yet there and you're trying to execute code against them, I mean, it's hard to see yourself maybe when you're developing on your own fast connection. So good other tips to pick up. This detail, though. Um, this is reminiscent also from our XML uh, days. Why is it in between these two script tags? The dot, 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 incidentally, here just represents put your JavaScript code here. So why encase it in C data? You don't have to worry about the problem being valid XHTML. Right, so you don't have to worry about your JavaScript code being valid XHTML or having symbols that in other contexts might be uh, misconstrued as demarking the start of tags. For instance, in many programs, we've probably people like us have written if x less than three for whatever reason. Well, that less than is a little problematic. So the fact that you're encasing it in the C data section means don't let me even have to think about some of those sort of stupid details as I'm embedding this code here. But the code doesn't have to be there. Oh, and incidentally, multiple versions of this. It's possible to specify what version of JavaScript the browser must support in order for the following to be rendered. I would say that this is not often witnessed. Um, being on the cutting edge of new language versions, generally not such a good idea anyway, unless you have a limited audience, but consider it an FYI. But an alternative and perhaps more popular approach to embedding JavaScript code, at least for large applications, is not in the page itself, but for efficiency purposes, for design purposes, is to put it in a separate file, much like you would any library code. So this is the syntax for including a file, in this case called file.js. You specify what's essentially the MIME type for it. And notice this, again, I'll critique stupidity, of the open tag, close tag. This is one of those annoying browser details. So the maybe anal side of me would really like to just put the close, the slash, inside of the start tag and make it an empty element. Bad stuff tends to happen on various browsers when you do that. Kind of work, works for some, doesn't work for others. So the best, most robust approach is just to get used to writing this tag this way. By contrast, I don't know of any browser that chokes on the link tag um, being closed atomically. So you'll often see, even in the course's website, we close the script tag explicitly, but the link tag, we use the slash inside of the start tag. So again, little things that are not worth getting tripped up over, especially if you're new to this world. So again, tuck them away somewhere. Um, no script. So for people who have JavaScript disabled or just the browser didn't get around to implementing support for it, there is a mechanism for responding to situations like that by way of this HTML tag. No script, which means to the browser, if you don't support JavaScript, at least execute the code between these two tags here. The idea being you can at least inform the user that there's a problem that you know about but clearly cannot fix. Right? You can't really detect if JavaScript's not working by using JavaScript. So this is sort of the um, last stop uh, po uh, possibility for this. Um, unfortunately, you know, just saying goodbye world isn't really a you know, it's not making your application much better, but it at least maybe saves you an email saying your site's not working. At least now you can tell them that it won't work. So, all right, so statements. Um, a quick overview of the syntax. The upside of introducing JavaScript on the heels of PHP and really any high level language like it, Java, C, C, is that syntactically it's really, really 
similar, which is a really nice thing because it's very easy to convert your sort of general savvy and comfort with programming, PHP in particular, and move right on into JavaScript. You're just executing the code elsewhere. And you have more of a fun domain, I think, to play in because a lot of JavaScript coding these days, and certainly Ajax stuff, is all about traversing the DOM and really understanding how a web page isn't structured underneath the hood because gone are the days where we just use it for stupid little alerts and for doing very simple error handling routines, which is good to start with, but it's a much more powerful language these days. Yeah? Um, actually, no script. Mm -hmm. Does the no script apply to just JavaScript, or could I have like every script, and would it turn off the other script? Good question. Um, so, I believe it would turn off the other script. Good question. So, I believe you can, for say, Microsoft browsers, actually use VB script inside the confines of the web page, and perhaps some head nods can confirm or deny this, in which case I suspect it would apply to that as well if you had a script type equals text slash VB script or whatever its uh, value is. I suspect it would apply there. To be honest, again, I am perhaps a little closed-minded about this these days, whereby it's just not possible to implement some applications without using JavaScript, and at least those are the kinds of things I tend to play with. So I don't even use this thing these days, but there are some compelling reasons still to do so. So it just depends, I think, on your target audience and what you want to design for. So just to give you a quick overview and perhaps a little comfort that not such a big deal to be migrating to this language now in conjunction with PHP is that there are these features here. And there's going to be a couple of new things. The for in construct is a little new, but we did have for each. And var sounds a little new. But try catch, even though we didn't talk about it in this course, is sort of a common approach um, to often paired with object oriented language. PHP has it um, for exception handling and some other features there. So a little reference there to where you can see these things if you just want to uh, expose yourself to all the information. But let's start talking about some of the things you can do and why you might want to do them. So uh, JavaScript is really nice in that um, almost everything is an object or a primitive or an array. So what does that mean? Well, primitive is just something like an int, or a string, or a float, or a very basic data type. JavaScript does not use strong data typing. You don't declare the types of your variables. Like PHP, there's a lot of implicit casting that goes on. But what's interesting, too, is that a lot of things uh, that might appear to be like primitives, like a string, is actually itself an object. And there are properties associated with strings and uh, methods associated with strings, um, much like there would be in, say, Java, if you come from that particular world. But arrays are one of the most useful data structures to use early on, especially when we get to the point of Ajax, where it's probably going to be about getting more data, which is probably going to come in the form of a big array, because you want to populate another drop-down menu or a big web page of lists, something like that. So the syntax for creating an array is one of two. You can either explicitly say new array in capital letters, effectively calling the uh, array class's constructor, though it's a bit of an abuse of the term to call it a class in JavaScript. Um, or you can use the more common and recommended pair of square brackets to create an empty array whose size is 0. Thereafter, you can start adding elements to it using this particular mechanism there. And a neat trick I'll mention here, lest it not come up in other examples, is unlike a language like C or C++, where you have to pre-commit to a size of your array, um, arrays in JavaScript are essentially vectors, where they will grow as large as they need to be to fit the objects you want to put in them. So actually, a neat trick, if I have an array called x that I initialize to be an empty array here, and I actually don't really love the idea of hard coding in my index values, especially if that kind of code was going to go in a loop. Right? It's kind of well, you could do it with like a very, uh, an I counter or whatnot. But know that there are tricks like this, which are nice syntactic sugar, or really sort of logical um, uh, conclusions to draw from the language itself. I can do something like x bracket x dot length, because by default, x dot length is going to be 0. And now I can say this is going to be the letter A. But if I do that same exact code again, x dot length, X dot length just already got implicitly plus plus by the addition of an element to what is effectively a vector. So this code now works too. And it's little tricks like this that I actually think make the language kind of fun to program in sometimes. So just FYI with that. But more interesting than arrays are objects. Um, and can I save myself from this transition here? Oh, there's my trick. Yes, already documented. Glad I wrote it all up on the board. So um, well, what happened here? Um, let me skip 
order here. So the other fundamental data structure in JavaScript is the object. And almost everything in JavaScript is an object. So JavaScript is, quote unquote, a prototype based language. Um, it is a language in which uh, functions are or functions are first class, which means that even functions are essentially objects. Um, for our purposes in the course, in terms of actually implementing um, project three and sort of providing a foundation in this, we won't dwell so much on the language semantics and specifications of these features, but I think we'll see by way of examples what the implications of this are. Um, JavaScript supports a number of really useful features like function closures, we'll see, anonymous, aka lambda functions, which are very commonly used, especially you'll see yourself um, in the context of Google's APIs and a lot of the examples that accompany them. So there are some global objects, so to speak, that ship with JavaScript and with them come some associated methods. And this is why it is useful for there to be some documentation so that you know what methods exist. Um, but these are most of them. And I would say among the most useful ones to use implicitly are certainly object and array, but you won't have to explicitly use those monikers, as you'll see. String, you really can't avoid using, because almost everything between browser and server is essentially a string, even if it looks like an int or a float, because the user probably provided it in some form. And then there are some other... Um, classes, so to speak, as well. So a little teaser of that. But what do we mean by an object? So this is kind of, so I was at a conference recently and someone joked, and I'm sure other people have joked this, that if you were to have one data structure on a desert island with you, the hash table is really like the Swiss army knife of, of data structures because it's so simple, but yet so useful. And with it, you can implement a whole number of other constructs with which you might be familiar from some data structures background. So uh, an object in the context of JavaScript is a collection of key value pairs. And as such, it is equivalent to what we saw in PHP and called associative arrays in that context. It's a hash table. It doesn't matter to you, the programmer, for the most part, how JavaScript or how the browser implements this idea of key value pairs. But what it means is that you can create an empty object, as with the second line up top there, with the curly braces, not with the square braces. And you can then proceed to put most anything you want inside of it. Um, the, in the keys can be numbers, they can be floats, they can be strings, um, they can, um, the values meanwhile can similarly be of any type. And so you can then retrieve this data not worrying about how the browser is finding that key in the particular object, it will return it to you. And so in this sense they are an even more generalized version of the array. So arguably, JavaScript doesn't need arrays because you can implement the idea of an array using an object whose keys just so happen to be numeric. But I suspect there are some performance implications or some uh, advantages to actually having the original data type. But I don't know. It might be perhaps part of a, more of a legacy thing as the language has evolved over time. What you can do with a uh, what you can do with objects is this. So if I have in this line created an empty object, open curly, close curly, semicolon, you can then put key value pairs in it using this notation here, whoops, using this notation here, the objects, the variables name dot, that whatever key value you want to give it, or object square brackets quote unquote key value. So just like PHP. Um, generally, the first approach is recommended using the dot notation. So what does this mean? Well, if I want to have an object or hash table that associates, say, um, people's, let's say, names, with, so usernames with phone numbers, whatever reason. So my username is sort of conceptually a good, unique key to use. So if I want to put someone's, if I have a new object that represents, say, some user, so I can have var o gets curly brace, close brace, and I decide, oh, you know what, o dot, um, oh, is this going to work? Yep, yeah. o dot, uh, no, nope, that's stupid. Let me change my example on the fly here. So o dot username for this object is going to be Malin, and then o dot, let's say, phone is also going to be a string, 617-523. 0925, it's all over the web, so no one ever calls, so not a problem. So <laughs> what we now have inside of that object are two different keys, each of which, if dereferenced, leads you to that particular value. And so what's really nice about a, uh, these um, objects, as we'll see, they're often used as hashes for passing a variable number of arguments 
to functions. So this is going to be very commonly seen in Google's APIs and really in a lot of JavaScript libraries in general when you want to pass maybe sometimes zero arguments because they're optional, but maybe a whole bunch of options sometimes. You probably know from past coding experience, it's kind of annoying if you have to pick an enumeration, an ordering from left to right of all of the arguments that can be passed to a function. And it's really problematic if not all of those arguments are required. So PHP, you may have noticed, you can make optional arguments. But once you make one argument optional, the, all of the rest to the right of it in the function signature have to be optional as well. Otherwise, how is the, the interpreter going to figure out what you omitted intentionally or not? So what's nice about objects or hashes in general is that you can pass in an object, which is a collection of key value pairs or arguments and values. And then the function can decide what, um, which of those to actually make use of. So we'll see this recur quite a bit. So let's go ahead and do something interesting. Well, uh, that's perhaps an overstatement. Something that's useful, um, even though it's a bit simple. So one of the things we do on the course's website when you visit it for the first time and proceed to log in is I personally hate websites where you pull up a page. The only thing you're meant to do on that page is log in or fill out a form. And you yourself have to move your mouse and click in the form and then start typing. Right? Like that's some very low-hanging fruit where a programmer with you know, five spare seconds can solve this problem. And the means by which to solve that do not exist on the server side, obviously, because this is now client-side UI. We need some line or lines of code that essentially tell the browser, move the cursor, move the focus of the page to that particular element. So if you've looked underneath the hood at our own website, we simply, because it was very easy to do, didn't require a lot of thought, but is perfectly valid to put it here, we at the bottom of the page have this. So this is toward the bottom of the page. It is inside of a div. It could probably be fit better, uh, probably more appropriate elsewhere, sort of removed from the flow of the document. But because of the dynamic generation of the pages, we have functions that generate the header of the page, the footer of the page. It's not quite as easy as, as one might like. So but it's OK to put here in line in the document. But let's just take a look. It's a little wordy, but this is perhaps our first snippet of JavaScript code here. All this is doing is the following. So um, first of all, it's telling us in comments what it's doing here. But per cursor in username field if empty. So I appear to be following some kind of hierarchy here. So if the document, so henceforth, this keyword document represents the root of the DOM that is the rendered web page in memory. So if document.forms, so it turns out that browsers support this forms property, this key property in the document object that returns to you all of the forms, open bracket, form, close bracket, those things that exist in this particular page, you can then step into a specific form by way of its name, so long as you've given that form a name. So in fact, let's just do a quick sanity check. If I scroll up here upwards in the page to this point, where again we're using tables intentionally for rendering purposes here, consistency, notice that we do have at the top right, whoops, we do have here at the top right a name applied to this form. So that's why the following step is actually going to work. And what are we saying after that particular step? So if document.forms.login.username, so if the username field in the form called logins value equals equals nothing, well, the implication to me is that's kind of where the first keystrokes need to go. Not in the password field. They didn't misauthenticate. It belongs in the username field. So now you need this line. So the Input elements in an XHTML DOM come with a method called focus. In fact, almost every element in an XHTML DOM can be given focus, though it doesn't make sense for some. You wouldn't really want to give focus, say, to a line break, for instance. But it does make sense for an input element or a window or an iframe, something like that. So call focus. And what that does is it moves the blinking to that particular field. Now, um, why this second line here? document.forms.login.username.value equals apparently the same thing. So we're not changing, but it almost seems like a no-op, right? We're not really doing anything. Uh, triggering a non-change event, not even. So this is one of these, again, sort of 
silly things that's kind of useful to at least hear once because otherwise you're going to just waste an hour of your life wondering why is the cursor, even though the user typed a username, Malin, maybe mistyped their password, and I've pre-populated the username field, right? it's kind of annoying if you do give focus, for instance, to a particular field, but it's not at the end of the string that's already there. So it's actually, as I realize this example needs to be fixed, inapplicable here because we already checked if the username field is null. But the reason for this, and I think I frankly just got a little copy paste happy, is by default when you give an input field focus, it puts the blinking cursor at the start of the input element, even if the user has already typed a partial string. So the UI nuisance there is that if I want to go change that field, I still have to move my browser or I have to use the delete key, which I tend not to use as often as, say, the backspace key. So it's, again, a little uh, browser inconsistency potentially there. All right, so inapplicable there. Very applicable and, no, also inapplicable there. Good lecture example nonetheless, though. So I say it's inapplicable there because I don't pre-populate the password field because then you're sending the password in the clear. So completely useless in this example here. Um, so what's wrong with this page? That, that'll be the setup to this slide next year. Um, so the second, uh, the else clause there simply says else give focus to the password field. So again, it's a nice little sugar. If, for instance, it used to really bother me that MySpace, when I actually used it, would not move the cursor automatically to the login field. Maybe this was intentional and that they'd kind of rather you click through some ads before you get around to logging in. But frankly, it might have just been some simple oversight or lack of knowledge of doing simple things. So this is, again, sort of the baby version of JavaScript for compelling but simple things. But you can very quickly start to do more interesting things still. For instance, validation. So same form, perhaps, but we now want to actually do a little bit of client-side sanity checking that the user is providing something legit. Yeah. Is there a gotcha? Uh, well, if the browser automatically supports uh, entering the username and password, would there possibly be a situation where you would want that person to pay the end because there's text there? That's a good save for my example. Yes. Um, for browsers that pre populate fields because you've said, remember this password? Yeah, that actually does kind of save me here. It's still irrelevant for the first one, for the username field, where I'm explicitly checking, is this field currently empty? But yeah, I think that would make sense. And I don't know firsthand because I actually disable the automatic password saving, but that could very well be the case. So that's a good call. So with validation, so a question that came up a few times already about project one, where we have just one little checkbox that expects that your, um, that your implementation of CS75 Finance do some client-side checking, is a question that's come up, at least anecdotally, do you, does that mean you don't bother checking server-side? So this is maybe a softball question, but if you have the ability to validate your user's data before it even gets to your server, that seems like it immediately simplifies our PHP code. True, false, discuss. OK. So you still have to, why? If they disable it, you don't want the user to that easily be able to disable all of your error checking routines and, and data cleansing routines. Other reasons? Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, you, especially these days where you know, it's very easily to anonymously and very viciously attack servers, you kind of have to play the defense when you write your code. And even I, to be honest, I was thinking about this last night while working on some of those maps features. I even superfluously call my MySQL real escape string on sometimes, frankly, data that comes back from my own database just because, frankly, I don't trust myself to have gotten every little piece right. Now, for performance, I'd eventually rip something like that out, but we're not getting thousands of hits a day on the, the Harvard map site, so it's kind of an OK ex expense. But for exactly that reason, I don't even trust myself, so I'm going to escape everything before it goes into my database. Other reasons that just using client-side validation, not so wise? Those are pretty good. Right, you maybe get, arguably give up some control over the aesthetics of the error handling. If you're sort of a bit lazy about it, you can just use JavaScript's alert function, which pops up a slightly differently looking window on various browsers, but at least conveys a message. Um, but even that with AJAX, can you integrate error messages right into the page itself? So, OK. So if we're convinced that um, this really doesn't save us anything on the server side, why create work for yourself? Client experience, uh, back that up. What does that mean? Um, it, potentially, if you're filling out a long registration form and it gets thrown back to the client with a dozen errors, it's really convenient if they are moving data since they submitted. So it's needed to catch it before it goes through the server, especially if you can do it live. But, you know, 
Sure. Sure. So just to recap, it improves arguably the user experience because the feedback is more immediate. There's one fewer HTTP requests and, and delays and spinning globes that needs to happen before the user actually gets some feedback. And in fact, you can even on the client side not just validate data, but even tidy it up. So I think a comment I made in a previous lecture about how sort of silly it is that a website requires me, the user, to type in my phone number in some pre prescribed format when they could do that not only on the PHP side, they could even clean it up on the client side. In fact, the Harvard Faculty Club, if you've ever navigated their website, actually has a useful feature whereby you, um, Harvard has these very long 33-digit billing codes for everything that you might want to buy on campus, even if you just want to go to lunch there for like a, a staff meeting. Um, but the website, just because it can, takes the 33-digit code and inserts the periods in the locations that no human ever remembers, at least I don't, where they need to go. And you can do that on the client side too, if only to help the user sort of sanity check themselves. So definitely user experience, I would say, is probably the overarching motivation. It does mean a little more work for, the, um, for you, the coder. But arguably, especially if you're worried about scalability and performance, the more you can kind of outsource to the user's computer, why not? They have all these thousands of um, billions of cycles available to them. Why not let them check the, do some error checking? Because then that's going to be a little less work for your servers, a few fewer HTTP hits on your particular server. So what might be involved in some client-side validation? Well, email. So we already have glimpsed the fact that JavaScript has regular expression support. Unfortunately, it's harder, at least for me, to wrap my mind around than PHP. PHP is very straightforward. Perl is very straightforward. The syntax for the regex is, is the same in JavaScript, but the functions with which you invoke the regular expressions, I would say personally, I've never quite found as easy to use. But they're there. Um, what else could you do client-side with, say, a form like this? Yeah, you could compare the passwords, sure. Terms and conditions, you can make sure that it's actually checked. So little things like that. And I would actually argue that there are some corner cutting reasons even to use client side validation because one, it's really pretty easy because you can keep the flow of logic entirely within the page and you don't have to, as you've already experienced, have to deal with this sort of common problem of I want the user to submit a form, say to a PHP engine, but I want the form to be validated server side, but if there's mistakes, I want to redisplay that page but that means I have to somehow communicate the inputs the user provided back to that page, which kind of suggests we have to take that trick of having the PHP form submit to itself so that everything is self-contained. Um, I mean, there's a lot of sort of setup involved in doing something fairly simple. So I would say even I, with that lunch application, if you recall, that quick and dirty thing I whipped up just to facilitate ordering lunches, I'm pretty sure that no like CS faculty member is going to try to submit an order with like, intentionally going to go in and spoof an order that's lacking like a beverage or something like that. Um, right? No one really has the time or interest in doing that. And I still escape my database fields, especially if someone else finds it. But the stupid stuff, like did you fill out this thing and this thing and this thing, that really wasn't the point of the app. The point was to save time, not only their time, but my time, frankly. And so I use only JavaScript uh, validation on that site because I figure, eh, if it gets in, there is actually a human who's not going to order a fake order because there's only like 12 people that ever go to lunch, so the standouts are there. So even then, I would argue that sometimes it's just the right tool because you don't need the heavier, hand, heavier handed approach. So let's take a five minute break and then peel back some of the layers of this and then move on to more sophisticated things still. All right, we are back. So this form, for instance, let me go ahead and pull up on the course's website. Uh, let's do this actually with uh, Firefox. This is the point in the course, frankly, where if you're not using Firefox for development, you really, really should. Um, I, again, have really no strong opinions on which tools to use for various things, except when it comes to this, because there are some amazing plugins, which, again, if you haven't downloaded yet from the software page on the course's website, uh, do start to. So for instance, uh, this little thing up here, the web developer toolbar, if you haven't used it yet, will be a godsend, especially, frankly, when you start using uh, JavaScript libraries, whether it's Yahoo's or jQuery or any number of other tools, where you kind of sometimes need to understand what kind of code they're generating, what kind of DOM nodes they're generating, especially if you want to override their CSS and change the stylization of things. It's a wonderfully valuable 
uh, tool. So um, with that said, let's pull up something simple here. And I'll start to use it more often, too, as, as problems arise that we can solve with it. So here's a very simple HTML form. If I go ahead and type whatever up here, anything here, anything here, check this box and, and submit, I get back this on the server side. So I'm submitting to a file called process.php, which is clearly a very simple thing. I think I spit out a pre tag, P-R-E, and then I do a print R so that I can see recursively everything in what object, does it seem? What am I print ring? So under a dollar sign underscore get or post or request. So one of those. So whatever the container is for this particular thing. And is it post or get from what you have? Oh. Yeah, so it is get because the URL changed. So I'm either printing get or I'm printing request. But recall that request has anything that came in via get or post or as a cookie. So it really aggregates everything. But I would say as a matter of design, Mm, that's sort of the lazy man's approach to getting input. Better to sort of uh, proactively specify where you expect it. What's all this underscore, underscore, UTMA craziness? Because it's very common to see. Google Analytics. Yes, so these are their cookies that came in on the wire. So I suspect I am printing out requests in this particular case. Um, bring them up only because it's very common to see on your website if you're using it and not really understand how they got there. Um, I am very simply going to go up to clear private data, clear my cookies, hit reload here, and now the, the distraction is gone. So this is what was submitted. Looks like there are four fields here. There's the cryptic looking stuff I sent. And again, here's some of the interesting stuff that's worth noting. When you check a box, the value that's sent is quote unquote on. Or it's either it's the string or nothing at all. So you can also do the implicit Boolean check. Is there anything there? If so, it's on or it's going to be off. So just little things that you can figure out for yourselves, frankly, using, again, these two-line PHP scripts that dump the contents of these variables. So no error checking whatsoever going on here. Let me go ahead and back up and do the following version. So here is form2.html. So now I'm going to type some stuff, some stuff, some stuff, check that box. OK, so here's an example of client-side validation. So it's very trivial, but it's saying you must provide the same password twice. I apparently didn't try to even deal with the perhaps complexity of validating an email address, but I can at least very easily check the password fields and thus save myself the HTTP hit and thus the delay that the user might experience. So how is this actually working? Well, we are going to steal some of the same syntax that we had a moment ago. Notice that I knew in advance that I'm going to be using this kind of code um, this time. So it's a simple page. I put it in the head element. But notice that I've wrapped this code in a function. So function notation in JavaScript says write the word function, space, followed by the function's name, and then in parentheses, a comma separated list of zero or more variables. No type specified, just the variables' names. We'll see in more sophisticated uh, JavaScript apps that there are other ways to define functions, but this is perhaps the most familiar. So validate is a function. Let's accept it um, on faith that this validates data and returns true if everything looks good, and it returns false if not. So for now, it is a black box to us. So let's take a look instead at how I'm using this. So here's my fairly simple HTML form. I just dumped it out with some BR tags between fields. But notice what's interesting. Even though I'm specifying an action of process.php, a method of get, notice this neat thing here. So what's really powerful about JavaScript and the DOM is that there are a whole number of things called events associated with those DOM nodes. There's a whole bunch of things that can happen in the course of a user's visiting a web page. For instance, a click can happen, a mouse down can happen, a mouse up can happen, a key down can happen, a key up can happen. So there's some very basic primitives that you, the programmer, by way of the browser can quote unquote listen for and register event handlers for, functions that handle those particular events. So what I'm saying here is that on submission of this form, go ahead and do what? Execute the code between these two quote marks. Well, what code do I want to execute? Return the return value of a function called validate, followed by semicolon. You'll find in JavaScript it's fairly sloppy when it comes to the need for semicolons. It's not necessary here. And generally, you don't even need them line by line by line. I, as a matter of good practice, and I think good style, is it's worth putting them in, despite the additional bytes that you're spending. But realize when you look at examples online, some developers might not be as rigorous. So I would strongly encourage you to get into the habit now Maybe not for one-liners like this, but again, I sort of make a design decision or style decision and just stick with it everywhere, typically. So how does a form get submitted? Via what input mechanisms? 
or a form like this in particular? How do you submit this form? Click the submit button or you just hit enter. So the reason to use the on submit handler, for instance here, is that there are actually multiple ways in which a form can get submitted. Again, clicking submit explicitly, often these days hitting enter, because the default behavior for a form in a browser these days is it acts as though the submit button were clicked in that case. So you want to be able to handle both of those cases. And technically, you can even use JavaScript to sort of manually submit a form on behalf of the, the user if they clicked like way over here, nowhere even near the form. So that too can happen, but that would catch that as well. So multiple reasons, but this just motivates why we put on, used on submit instead of something, say, on click with just the particular button. Yeah. So if you have, so that, so what would happen there if you have multiple submit buttons that have different names? Um, and you submitted the form, you would get the different name value pairs submitted. Um, and no, so they're all sent. They're all sent. So you can actually see this, in fact, if we go to google.com. And I am just going to search for foo. And hit, oh, there's some fancy autocomplete for you. Foo and hit Enter. So notice what happened at the top here. So in addition to Q equals foo being sent, what was also sent, even though I didn't click it? So button G, B-T-N-G is the name that Google gave to its button. And its value is obviously, per its label, Google search. So my point is that even though you're hitting enter, the values of any elements of type submit are also submitted as well. And that's why we see them getting submitted here, even though, again, I did not click Google's Google search button. So if you have multiple submit buttons, all of their values will be submitted, at least if they're uniquely named. And I suspect if they're identically named, uh, the behavior is probably undefined, or the last one is submitted, something like that. OK. Um, so what are we actually doing then in the code? Well, notice the form itself is no different. We've got an input field, a password field, another password field. Notice I have given different names to these things, as you would in PHP. We need to be able to distinguish the two. But the input type even down here is different, or is rather, is completely the same as it would be in other contexts. So let's see what happens when this function validate is called. Well, if I scroll up here, it looks very similar to the code we were using just to trigger focus before. So if the documents, forms called registrations, field called emails, value equals equals quote unquote, go ahead and the whole building is shaking for some reason. Um, so go ahead and trigger this alert. You must provide an email address. And then return false. And I'm returning false because what happens with the browser is if the on submit event handler is defined for a form, it, ex it expects that value to be returned as either true or false. If it's true, that means, OK, go ahead and submit this form. If it's false, it stops the form submission. And nothing gets communicated to the server. So I'm returning false there because there is, in fact, a problem. Else, if the password one field's value is also empty, go ahead and say, you must provide a password. Else, if the value of password one does not equal the value of password two, Go ahead and alert. You must provide the same password twice. Else, if that last box is not checked, similarly yell at the user. Now, what's the syntax here? Well, the, the key takeaways, at least for now, if you're unfamiliar with client-side DOM programming, is clearly input elements have a field called value. So you can get that with dot value. A ch inputs of type checkbox have a property called checked, which is either true or false. And so these are the basic building blocks that you check when using DOM elements. Radio buttons, too, have a checked, uh, yeah, I think they use checked property, whereas a select menu has a selected property. So there's a few things there, and these are um, things you'll come across over time. And that's it. So that actually gets in the way of this form being submitted if and only if the user actually allows JavaScript to go through. Well, can we do this a little differently? So that was form two. In form three, just so that you see a few 
uh, syntactic details, um, it gets mildly annoying to have to write out such long strings again and again and again, especially since we're really just wasting bytes. Now granted there's a whole lot of other wasted bytes in this file, but that felt a lot pretty redundant. Document.forms.registration. Document.form. So there is, for instance, the with keyword that says go ahead and assume between the following set of squiggly braces that anything I don't explicitly mention from left to right starts with this following prefix. Yeah. It doesn't. I'm sorry? No, so the action attribute of the form is only relevant when the form is actually submitted. So if this function returns true, the form gets submitted. Where does it get submitted? To the value of the action field. So that comes in step two. So step one is the onSubmit handler gets used. Step two is the action value gets used. OK, so what? OK, so that's really some. Little syntactic sugar. Frankly, I never use that particular feature since I tend not to use um, this particular approach. I tend to use library code to get DOM elements that I want that's a little more succinct, but more on that in just a bit. So form four, what else can we do? So there's another approach altogether that's possible. And this is representative of some more sophisticated JavaScript code. Still pretty sent, um, still some pretty um, playpen type examples, but building into something more interesting and starting to hint at what exists within this language. So let me uh, move this over just so it fits on uh, the screen better. So notice that this form is again returning the result of the validate function, but it's passing in something a little funky called this. So if you come from the world of, say, Java, uh, Java uh, or uh, C++ or even PHP, object-oriented PHP, you know about the this keyword, which refers to sort of the element or the object in context. At this point in the story, because this onSubmit attribute is attached to the element called form, this is a reference to that DOM node. So it sort of gives you immediate access to, once this HTML is rendered as a tree, to the element in memory that represents this node in the tree. So I'm passing in this because this allows me a little bit of power now, because now I can let validate take an argument, and I can even reuse it for multiple forms on my page. I no longer need to hard code the name and really the path, so to speak, to that particular form. Notice that I can now take a parameter called f, just because it's the form. It's meant to be of type object here, or a DOM node. And notice now I can just check if f's email field value equals nothing, then do the following. And the rest of the code is the same. But now we've made slightly more reusable code by allowing the same function to take an input, namely the form that you want to validate against. And you can certainly imagine this code now being more useful, especially if you tuck it away into like a util.js file that you like to use for a bunch of different things. So again, a little baby step there. Well, what more can we do if we take this up a notch further? So we can actually do kind of a neat property with disabling. So I think I even used this in that lunch app because there was this little feature that we didn't spend time on that day, but we wanted people, we wanted the site to remember people's most recent order so that in the interest of efficiency, a faculty member could just say, give me what I got last week, my default order. But just for reasons of database design, if they chose their default order, I didn't want them to be able to provide special requests in another field that you may remember. It asks for your name, special requests, check a box, submit. There was only three pieces of information. But default order to me meant remember not only what the person ordered last week, but also their special requests. So there was this little interesting design decision where do I let them provide a new special request, thereby overriding the old one, or do I sort of assume that your default order is exactly what you told us last week? I decided to take the simpler route. If you want what you wanted last week, you're not changing your special request. Just place a new order entirely. And as such, I wanted to disable the special request field just so that there was no confusion and no yelling at me that Friday when the wrong thing showed up because the website ignored that field. So you can turn off elements in a web page, which many sites do for UI purposes as follows. So this is uh, example five here. Let me go ahead and pull this up. So in example five, is it, uh, let me just make a quick sanity check. Yep. In example five, let me go ahead and say hello, da da, and notice what just happened. So it's a little subtle, 
But notice that when, only when I check the checkbox does the submit button actually get highlighted. So again, it's a mild UI enhancement. Frankly, the world survived just fine without this particular feature. But again, if one of the motivations for introducing any of this stuff in the first place is to start writing more sophisticated web-based applications, even little pieces of detail like this are useful and make even more clear the relationship of clicking that button. Now, arguably, I can push back in this and say, you know, there are people in this world, you know, people who often call me for technical support, who are not going to notice this arguable subtlety of the font color ever so slightly changing on the button. So again, it's not necessarily a huge value add, but at least, you know, someone will probably realize something's wrong here. Whether or not they make the connection is perhaps a, a debate for user interface type people. But how do we do this is perhaps the more relevant detail. And how does it relate to the DOM? Well, notice that I again have this validate function. And for this, I just copied and pasted an old one. Didn't really matter to me at this point in the demo which version I was using. I wanted the job to get done. But notice that I did do this in my form. In my form down here, and let me move it onto a separate line for clarity. Notice that I'm at, on the checkbox element, input type equals checkbox, I'm using the on click uh, element, uh, the on click handler. So on clicking of this element, I'm not even distinguishing if it's turning on or turning off, just on any click, go ahead and invoke the toggle function. So what does the toggle function do for me? Well, let me go ahead and scroll back up here. It's actually pretty smooth. It's, a, it's you know, a, two lines of code really here. So if the, da, 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 the button is disabled. If the disabled property of the input element, which apparently exists, just like the checked properties can exist and, and other such properties, if disabled is true, what am I effectively doing? I'll just set it to false. Else, set it to true. So what this is doing for me is, again, on clicking that checkbox, if the submit button, which again is called button, is disabled, we'll enable it else disable it, right? So it's just a toggling if state. Very simple, but again, hints at how you access these various properties. Well, what more can we do on top of that? Well, this version here in, let me go ahead and open this, in form 6.html uh, has a little slight enhancement for better or for worse. So notice there is no more toggle function because I realize this line of code is so easy. I don't really want to clutter my source code with a function I'm only going to call in this particular place. So realize, too, you can actually have one-liners here or there. Now, again, this is maybe not the best practice. In fact, for more sophisticated apps, for instance, the map, I have no JavaScript code anywhere in any of my PHP files or any of my HTML files. So even my event handlers, on click, on submit, I register after the fact by giving my DOM elements ID attributes and saying once my JavaScript code executes, my initialize function, for instance, Go find me this node and add this handler. Go find this node and add this handler. And it really allows me to more cleanly separate code from presentation. But you can nonetheless do this. So inside the on click attributes value can go actual JavaScript code. As we've seen, you can induce a function, but you could technically put statements there as well. And again, this is a sort of a quick and dirty thing, um, but realize it's not necessarily the best decision. And this is elegant or neat only insofar as I'm just inverting the value with bang, which is a more cleaner approach perhaps than the unnecessary if else condition, when I can just flip state uh, more uh, cleverly like that. So regular expressions. Let's take this client side validation to a more useful level now. Oh, and incidentally, to be clear, this is all process.php is. So again, poor man's approach to sort of debugging messages, the printf of PHP. So here is this example here where I'm going to actually say, all right, my username is mail-in, passwords, whatever, passwords, whatever, check the box, submit. Interesting. You must provide a .edu email address. So didn't want to get bogged down in the complexities of what defines an email address, but I figured some easy example is let's just at least weed out people who don't so much as provide what appears to be a .edu address. Well. To demonstrate this, the validate function is almost the same except for this first line. So let me go ahead and move it, move part of it to its own line here so we can zoom in. So if it's not true that document.forms.registrations.emails.values matches the following. 
So we said earlier that among the objects in JavaScript are string object. So anything that's a string, including the value of an input field, which by definition is a string, whether it's the empty string or an actual string, has methods associated with it. And what the W3Schools website is actually good for is, are these particular examples, some very easy functions to invoke. The match function literally says, does this string that I'm calling the dot operator on match the following regular expression? For reasons I do not know, regular expressions are not quoted typically in JavaScript. You just use the side slashes. I find this very strange, since to me it's a string. It just happens to embody a regular expression. But so be it. You can actually do even funkier things um, that I tend not to do just because I think it makes it less readable. You can have a regular expression of some sort here and then call a function on it because this effectively is a string. But this is where the language starts to get a little too, a little too Perl like, a little too fancy for its own good. But just realize that if you're reading up on various documentation, you will see many different approaches to some of these problems. I at least try to highlight what I think are the most straightforward ones. But there are some performance um, enhancing functions, that was unintentional, like um, a compile function, where you can define a regular expression using that class called regex, and then compile it if you know you're going to be using a regex a whole lot of times on a particular web page. You know, not five or ten, but if you're validating a whole lot of data or doing something with regular expressions, there are some interesting client-side optimizations that do motivate learning alternative approaches to regexes than just these simple functions. So realize that too. So this is fairly simple. It's saying if this strings, if this value, if that string matches dot, which is some character plus, so one or more such characters followed by an at sign, followed by one or more whatevers, um, dot, literal dot, hence the backslash edu, and the dollar sign means what? End of string. So thankfully, a lot of these regexes, they're portable across these languages we've been seeing, just means make sure this string at least has an at sign somewhere, dot edu at the very end, and yes, yeah, sure, there could be 10 other at signs in there. I'm not going to realize it, but it was at least, at least good enough for just doing a little bit of client-side validation. So there's a line, perhaps, that uh, one needs to decide for him or herself as to how much is necessary there. So some useful re um, references here. Besides the tutorial, the canonical documentation is up there on Mozilla's site. Yeah? What if you just want to send all these alerts? How does JavaScript hook into your HTML if you want to send a message to HTML? Ah, so good question. And it's, a, it's something we will spend great amounts of time on when, in the context of AJAX. Because one typically, so technically, we could do that. So let me go ahead and let me do the following. I, I decided recently I'm going to try to be a bit braver and actually do things that haven't been prefabbed at the risk of them blowing up in, on things, uh, blowing up in the middle of class. But let me do this. I'm going to create what's effectively a container element in this page. It has nothing in it, but I'm going to put something in it if I actually need to. So it's kind of a placeholder. And let's see, I don't want to use alert anymore for the email address, but notice I gave it an ID of message. So I know how to find it easily. Um, so let me go ahead and up here, go up here. Um, and you can do this. I would say it's more common to do what we're about to see in the context of AJAX. It doesn't need to be. So I'm going to say um, var, um, let me call it, be more explicit, var l for element gets document dot get element by ID, which is one of the most useful built-in functions in the JavaScript uh, implementation of DOM. It was called message. So if all goes well, this will return to me a reference to that node in the tree that represents this web page. Now what do I want to do with it? Well, let me go ahead and say elements dot inner HTML property, which is technically non-standard, but every modern browser appears to support it. And it is a very common approach to dynamically inserting data into a web page. And in fact, based on various um, speed tests that I've seen other people document online, actually tends to be faster than the right way of doing this, which I'll mention in just a moment. But let me change the inner HTML property of that element to uh, invalid email, exclamation point, semicolon, return false. So if this example doesn't blow up on me, let me go ahead and reload the form. Um, type in mail-in again. Uh, type in password. Type in condition submit. Ah, OK. So ugly. I didn't spend much time on aesthetics, but an example of inserting information into the DOM. And now, actually, this is a good time for me to mention Firebug. 
So Fire, how many of you have already used Firebug? Okay, so a handful, maybe more for CSS stuff, it's wonderfully useful for JavaScript. And in fact, there's two tools we recommend on the course's software page. One is called Firebug, hands down one of the most amazing tools for web development ever invented, um, and it's free. Um, and JavaScript Debugger, which is a, it, it's, I can't, it's not clear to me if it's any more or any less sophisticated than Firebug, but I can say from personal experience, it has sometimes caught things or printed out error messages that for whatever reason Firebug has not showed to me. So essentially I keep it in my menu and whip it out only when there's clearly a problem. Firebug's telling me nothing and I just assume that it's a limitation of Firebug for whatever reason and the JavaScript debugger just in its console window. I don't even use it for breakpoints because it's, it's a much heavier plugin. It tends to even lock up Firefox on me for what it's worth but it sometimes shows me the error message or the exception that's being triggered. So FYI there too. So when you trigger Firebug, which is just this bug in the bottom right hand corner, and you can also get to it I think via the tools menu once it's installed, um, you need to by default enable the various tools for a website. So by default it doesn't look at anything look at anything you're doing. I typically, especially for web development, I just enable everything. Even if I'm not sure what I'm going to be using it for, I, I see few downsides. I click apply and now you get an interface that it might take you a few times to just get a little comfortable with but once you get the hang of it and it's not complicated so amazingly powerful it's a debugger and sort of um, in uh, it's a DOM inspector a program for inspecting the DOM on the fly so I bring this up now for the following reason let me go ahead and reload this form entirely um, let me go ahead and click HTML and notice and this uh, all the more motivates valid XHTML um, it can show things literally as a DOM. Now it's using our conventional indentation approach and plus to expand things, but that is a tree. That's the in-memory representation that's been broken down into this cute little uh, plus and minuses to expand and dive down deep. So that'll be useful in a moment because I'm going to do the following. Let me expand the body. There's my form. Let me expand the form. And let me blow this up to be a little larger so that you can see. So this is again just the HTML. It's been kind of reformatted to sort of um, fit on the screen. You'll notice your attributes will sometimes appear in different order. CSS properties, same deal. It's not a problem. Order does not matter, but realize it's the tool, not you. And notice that there's nothing in my div other than some white space there. So that's the takeaway for the moment here. And notice too, especially when you're trying to work through stylization issues with CSS, um, notice this amazingly useful feature. If you hover over a page like this, you can literally see that, oh, this is what this input element corresponds to. This is what this one corresponds to. If I scroll up and go to the whole form, ah, that's the whole form. Now this is arguably not that useful for such a simple page, but I will say as recently as yesterday when I was on the real Google Maps, I was trying to overlay, as you may recall, that special features icon. And I was trying to figure out, frankly, how they position theirs you know, next to their existing buttons. Now the problem is that you can't just view the source code for this web page and see all of their no DOM nodes because most of the Maps interface is dynamically generated on the fly by JavaScript code. But someone knows what is implementing this page underneath the hood, the browser certainly, and thanks to Firebug, so does Firebug, or so can you. So what I was doing that day was things like this. I tried to right click on these buttons because usually you click right click on an element in the page. For instance, I'm curious to see how they implemented this set default location link. So I right click. I choose inspect element, Firebug opens, and immediately jumps to that element in the DOM, which frankly is useful for stylization. I want to see what classes are on it, what style attributes, just because I'm trying to learn or override something. Problem with Google's interface is that they're detecting my mouse clicks and not letting them through to the browser. So I did this hackish approach. Well, I right clicked something nearby, which it did let me click on, chose inspect element. I know that the more dot 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 thing is proximal to that button. So I went to this search, not Firefox's built in search, it normally appears down here. And I searched for, I think, more dot dot dot. There it is. So now it found that element on the page. And all of these DOM nodes have been dynamically inserted. So now if I hover over this, I've now found that element, which again is not going to be useful typically, but I had a very specific goal in mind. I was trying to figure out how I replicate what they did. And frankly, CSS for me is very complicated at times absolute positioning, relative positioning. I have no idea half the time how I can implement what I want unless I go figure out how someone else solved that problem and try to adapt my solution or adapt theirs to mine. And so this in short is exactly what I did. And just 
This speaks to the power of this tool if you've never really poked around underneath the hood. So let's go ahead and use it for our purposes here. Again, message is currently empty. It's just a couple white space characters. Let me go ahead now and type uh, mail in, some password, some password, check that box, submit, and there it's immediately being inserted by way of that inner HTML property into the actual DOM. Now you can do funkier things still. Um, we could have done something like this. Now again, this is getting very sloppy, but just to demonstrate what's possible, you know, I want to do something like this. Span. I know in advance, you know what, I really want this uh, text to be red and the font weight to be bold. And let me go ahead and close quotes, span, uh, invalid email, close span. So just to demonstrate that you can dynamically insert what become DOM nodes by way of raw HTML, let me go ahead and reload here. Mailin, whatever, uh -huh, uh -huh. submit. Okay, so now it's red and bold, and if we reveal what actually happened down here, even that node has been inserted. So I say this is sort of uh, the sloppy approach, because one, it's technically not standards compliant, and it's a little messy to generate H XHTML on the fly using JavaScript, because you can imagine doing a lot of uh, appending using JavaScript's append operator. I often screw the two up when I'm back and forth. That's PHP's concatenation operator. That's JavaScript's. In invariably, you will get the two confused, at least if you're like me. Easy thing to fix. Wonderful when Firebug tells you what you did wrong because of the line number. So this is a little sloppy because, again, we're now mixing some of the presentation with the actual code. But I would say when we get to Ajax, you'll f I'll, f I'll argue very strongly that it is so useful to be able on the server side to not just return always some JSON data and not just return some XML data, but just generate the HTML code on the server, then just return it as one big fragment and let the browser plug it into play. Because what you'll actually find, it, it, either via experience or various studies that people have done or tests that people have done, the right way to do what we just did is code more akin to this. So ditch inner HTML altogether and instead do this. So var child gets document, uh, create element, and call it a span element. And then you would say child.add attribute. So these are DOM functions. Um, they exist in other languages, but uh, this is JavaScript's implementation of them. I would then say something like style, and then I would say something like color. So dot, dot, dot. I find this to be much heavier handed. And the problem is that when you're doing a lot of dynamic node creation, Browsers tend not to perform very well. So the speed test to which I'm alluding that I read up on it recently is this past week, because I was trying to decide too, do I take the sort of non-standards approach, but the really easy approach of generating all of my content server side where I've got a really fast CPU anyway, or render it through this approach, which I would argue too is a little less readable than sometimes just generating some XHTML code for large data sets and large numbers of iterations. People report that the DOM approach is actually slower typically. So it's a, it's a trade-off. Um, but if bandwidth is what's expensive, Google probably doesn't want to be sending more HTML code and more bytes than they want to because you multiply every byte by the pennies it costs them in the aggregate. That's exp an expensive design decision. So those kinds of calls, too, need to weigh in. So that's another approach, and we'll see that way more in the context of our um, Ajax discussion. So a long but hopefully um, useful discussion of the same uh, kinds of topics we'll soon see. Any questions on JavaScript and uh, on rather on the example here? I will show you one other thing, what's neat and powerful here, especially as you're doing markup. If I realize on the fly, oh, you know what? This is kind of an ugly looking thing. Let me go in here and see what my site would look like with green. Well, you can do things like that on the fly, which isn't so compelling for colors, but if you're doing alignment and padding and silly stuff like this, so useful to do it on the fly rather than constantly hitting refresh. I didn't discover this tool. For, I knew about this tool for some time, didn't discover it till this year. Hugely regret not having picked it up before this past year. So hopefully a useful takeaway. So what event handlers exist that are useful? So all, not all of these apply to every particular element, but among the most popular ones and perhaps most self-explanatory event handlers that you can define on various nodes in a DOM are 
uh, things like clicking, as we've seen, and mouse up and down and out and over that I've alluded to. In fact, the sort of 1990s use of uh, JavaScript was often to do image rollovers, whereby you would check if the mouse is over an element, change the graphic. If it's out of the element, change the graphic back. You can do that with a couple lines of JavaScript code using exactly these event property, uh, these event hand, uh, these events, and implementing handlers for them. Um, mouse down and mouse up allows you to detect clicks in different states of clicking. On submit, we saw on select is from a drop down. So it's very useful in websites to allow the user to select an option from a select menu, but not actually have to click uh, uh, go or submit. You can do that by listening for on select on a select element and go ahead and execute some JavaScript code. Um, blur is the opposite of focus. So if the user navigates away from a field or an element, you can say, whoa, you better go back and fill out that field. Mildly annoying, though, for that example, I'd say. Focus is a little more useful. Key down and key up. For a lot of interactive tools, for instance, just to use this as an um, easily accessible example, there's a whole bunch of use of these same properties that had to go into the implementation of this. For instance, the autocomplete widget, which again, I only stitched together using some off-the-shelf tools, but these same principles must underlie this. If I start typing science, at some point the website realizes, oh, there's some input there. But what it's probably not doing is querying for that data the moment my finger goes down on the key. And why is that probably true? Why is it probably not going immediately the moment I depress the key? Annoying. So annoying maybe, but even worse than yet, worse than that, if I'm thinking selfishly. Constant, Constant what? OK, so you might want the user to have some time to maybe finish the word they're on so you can validate it completely, or they've pasted something in. But I'm actually alluding to something in terms of performance and scalability. Here's my little sniffer. Let me go ahead and shrink the window a little. And now let me go ahead and say MA, whoa, what just happened? So where is this data coming from? So in this case, it's apparently coming from the server. And we can kind of reverse engineer how I implemented this um, how I implemented this particular search field. So notice that apparently, even though the user didn't realize it, when I just started clicking, some number of milliseconds later, this widget, this auto completion technology, is just constantly listening and listening and listening. And if it realizes, oh, David has stopped typing for half a second, must mean he's paused and wants me to help him out with some suggestions. Let me go ahead and query via HTTP GET suggest.php on the server and pass in a query of MA. So one of the motivations for not doing it immediately is that I'm going to hammer the hell out of my server if I'm requesting data support, requesting suggestions every moment in time. Now, arguably, I could have moved all of this data client side. I actually found that on a normal connection, even my home network connect, a home cable modem connection, there was no difference in performance whether I preloaded all 600 building names into the web page itself or just fetched what I wanted on demand. So I kept it simple and just let it do it querying on the client side. Now, Google, when I just searched through Google with the drop down and got back hundreds of thousands of suggestions, like that's obviously not being cached locally and searched locally, clearly being searched on the server side there. Um, but um, yeah, uh, there was a follow up comment there. Yeah, OK, question. OK, so what else can we do with this? Well, with JavaScript, can we actually tweak CSS? And this becomes useful, too, when you want to alter not just silly things like font size and color, as I alluded to a moment ago, but display. So for instance, there are properties associated with various DOM elements, like how they're displayed. And typically, a div is displayed by default as a block element, which means show it from left to right um, and just take up as much space as the element requires on the page. It's in block mode. But if you want to hide that element, you want to change display to what's called none. So it literally disappears. And again, to be clear, what's happening on, for instance, our implementation of this event site, when you go ahead and click an event and want more information about the Harvard Journal Club and you reveal more information, what's really going on under here underneath the hood is that this thing here is a TR element. 
This thing below it is also a TR element, but by default, I've set the CSS property to that other TR element to be display equals none. So it just doesn't appear. And anytime you set a block element, like a div, to none, it means it takes up no space in the browser. So it creates the illusion of it being hidden. Now, by contrast, in FYI, there's another related property called visibility. So if you're, this again, even though we're now commingling discussions of stylization and such, it all comes together in these uh, more dynamic UIs. Visibility can be set to um, hidden or, what's the other one? I rarely use it. Hidden or show? Yes, I think show or hidden. Visible. So visible can be hidden or show. There's no consistency sometimes in CSS. So visible or show, the difference is if you, um, if you, hidden. If it's hidden, it is hidden, but it still takes up as much space as it would if it were not invisible. So that's the difference. Display collapses it if it disappears. Visible does not. This might be useful if you don't want your UI jumping all around. But in this case, I did want the thing to grow and expand, and so I went with display. So there is a line of code um, within um, the actual code driving, uh, within the actual JavaScript code that um, checks is the style property of that particular TR element equal to quote unquote block? If so, change it to none. If it's set to none, change it to block. So it's the same exact idea that we were checking for conditionally. Is it equal to nothing or something? Change it. So it's the same kinds of basic principles. So again, getting a little more comfortable with CSS will become increasingly useful, not just for style, but for actual functionality. So unfortunately, there is a bit of a mess in the CSS world whereby there's a whole lot of CSS properties that have hyphens in them. That's not such a good thing when it comes to JavaScript properties because it looks more like a minus sign in between a property and some other token. So the world had to convert CSS properties to um, a JavaScript safe equivalent. I don't know why you didn't see this one coming, right? They've both been around for a while. Thankfully, this guy at codepunk.hardwar.org um, wrote up a nice little page that summarizes the equivalences. To be honest, I've not had to use it much because there are other, oh, his site might actually be down now. Um, this was or is a chart that just cor correlates this to this, font size, font size. But essentially the rule of thumb is this. If in U CSS you know there to be a property called font hyphen size, in JavaScript you can access it as a property called font uppercase size, no hyphen. So silly things, but useful to perhaps hear once and then tuck away somewhere memorable. Uh, no, they have org.uk. It definitely worked once upon a time. So for what it's worth, uh, if you don't need a chart if you can remember that heuristic there. So that's how it works. Um, so let me point out um, a re-implementation of something stupid. So that blink tag that most every browser has removed over time, which is actually kind of annoying because there's some times where I like to use it. Um, for instance, in my fall course, we have a whole bunch of office hours during the week. And just because we want to make it clear when students can get help right now, we wanted there to be just a little, a little discreet, but some flashing text on the side anytime office hours are in progress, just to catch their eye and to really cut down on the, oh, I didn't know there were office hours, right? It's kind of hard to ignore the blink tag. But the blink tag doesn't exist anymore, or at least if it's there, the browsers ignore it. First time in history that the browsers seem to remove features as opposed to just adding new things. But um, this is a JavaScript function that allows me to re-implement the blink tag using, again, these same fundamentals. Now, you don't have to ever use this code, but it does demonstrate a few different things. So one, this is what I decided to do. I wanted to still be able to write in my page, open tag, blink, close tag, and then a word, and then the close blink tag. But again, the browser is going to ignore that these days. So I wanted to use some DOM functions in JavaScript. Whenever this code executes, get me all those nodes that David has pre, um, um, padded with blink and close blink, and return them to me in a variable called blinks. Um, just by inference, what does get elements by name apparently return? An array. So whereas get element by ID, by nature of what an ID is, returns just one element or none, null, get elements by name will return an array of size zero or more of those div of those blank elements. Now what am I going to do? Here's a for loop in JavaScript, pretty familiar syntax still. I'm using the length property. So PHP, you need the count function, not so in JavaScript. If the ith blinks elements 
styles, visibility property equals equals visible, go ahead and make it hidden, else do the opposite. So this function is kind of like that toggle function. It just changes state depending on what the state is. But that's not enough. What do I now need to do to make this thing useful? Otherwise, all my tags are just going to, and then that's it. All right, if I call the toggle function, what do I need to do just conceptually? So I need to loop. Hmm? I need to recall it. And a loop, at least in the conventional sense, is problematic because a loop is a very synchronous thing. I could write an infinite loop. Maybe I could even sleep in there somehow with the appropriate function. But that loop is going to suck up the entire program's execute, uh, attention so to speak. So we need some kind of asynchronicity. We need to be able to say, go, implement, go call this function every what, half a second, one second, whatever the standard was, or whatever I decided on. So there are some wonderfully useful tricks like this function, window.setInterval. So the window object is something you get for free when you're coding in JavaScript within the confines of a browser. Document's another. That's the DOM. Window is sort of a higher level concept, the graphical thing known as the window that contains the DOM and more. Window.setInterval is a function that takes two arguments. One, it takes a snippet of JavaScript code that you want to run and followed by the number of milliseconds you want to wait before executing that code again and again and again. There's a similar function called window.setTimeout which has the same signature but lets you call some code once, uh, some number of milliseconds from now, and then never again. So this is the difference. So the idea is if I embedded that blink function, which you're welcome to try tonight in some simple JavaScript page, you can take a lecture example, rip out the other stuff, and just paste it in and fill it with blink tags. Go ahead and put this line of code somewhere else in your um, JavaScript script, and you can induce this blinking of tags. Now, notice what I've wrapped this in, though. So this is kind of interesting, and it allows us to segue to this discussion of libraries, which are hugely um, powerful and increasingly necessary to develop interesting apps quickly. So Yahoo uh, has this package called the uh, Yahoo User Interface, so YUI, which is how they pronounce it. Frankly, I always want to say UI because it's quicker, but YUI is how they like to pronounce it. And YUI has a whole bunch of widgets, a whole bunch of utility functions that just make it much easier, I think, to interface with JavaScript across multiple browsers without having to worry about as much what browser you're interacting with. So it really helps level the playing field, which is hugely valuable. We promoted their CSS early in the semester just to normalize some aesthetics. Using their JavaScript stuff also helps level the playing field with slight incompatibilities across browsers, especially as we'll see with AJAX. Microsoft completes the AJAX, implements the prerequisite AJAX object completely differently from every other browser. It's really kind of a waste of your developer time to have to deal with that if a library can abstract away those details. So one of the functions that Yahoo provides is a function called yahoo.util.event. It's kind of a faking of namespaces um, called add listener. This takes a reference to an object, in this case the window. It wants it to listen for the load event. So whereas you have an HTML on load, on submit, on click. When you're just calling the event by its name, it's just the name of the event, no keyword on. And then notice this neat trick. So the third argument to this particular function is itself a function. So I could do one of two different things. This function's purpose in life, as you can probably infer, is meant to tell the window uh, or to rather tell the browser the moment the window is loaded. Everything's sort of loaded in memory and you are good to go go ahead and call this function. Now, I don't really care what this function's called because I'm only going to call it once. I never need to refer to it again. And I don't want to clutter my namespace or my brain with multiple functions names that, again, I only need one time. So this is an example of an anonymous or lambda function that is a function. It will get executed when the time is right, 500 milliseconds, or rather, the moment the window is loaded. But that's it. I don't need to keep around a reference or a pointer to it because it's only going to be used this once. And to make clear the distinction here, what I could do technically is this. I could say, you know what, don't call this anonymous function. I'm much more comfortable with the idea of telling you, call the function called startup and just call it a day, close my parenthesis, semicolon. Then what I could do down here then is function startup and then do that same exact code and make it look like this. Ignore the autocomplete or the autocorrect. I could do that. Another trick, as you'll see uh, throughout um, the documentation, is I could also do this: var startup 
gets function that takes no arguments and then put a semicolon here. That's the same approach. So functions, much like back in the day C, you can pass functions around by pointers. Similarly in JavaScript, you can pass functions around. You can store their objects in variables because they are first class functions and that functions themselves are effectively objects that, crazy enough, can themselves have properties inside of them. Properties, if you really start diving into JavaScript, can really be used to mimic the idea of private and public member variables, which is kind of neat. So uh, JavaScript is not object-oriented in the sense you're probably familiar with, but you can use it um, to mimic some of those same principles in the same way. So I've gotten to the habit of using a certain uh, model for JavaScript that does mimic public and private methods just because kind of, I like coding within that framework. But it again, sort of don't worry so much about that for, say, project three. Um, so what else can you do with these utilities? Well, there's a whole bunch of them out there. And actually, just a teaser on one, since I am biased only insofar as I love Yahoo because they do so much. They are very good about accessibility things and actually thinking through accessibility things, whereas some, uh, I think Dojo has kind of not so much worried about it. XTJS um, uh, really hasn't given much thought to it. So there's those kinds of things you might want to bear in mind. But if you just glimpse Yahoo's page again, if you haven't already, if you need a slider, a tab view, some kind of uploading mechanism, a rich text editor, menus of some sort, um, color pickers, there's no reason for you to spend days implementing those pr basic building blocks yourself. You can pull these widgets off the shelf. But not only from Yahoo, where it is in fact free, but also these are probably the most popular JavaScript libraries out there today. There's more, but these are the names that certainly recur. And they differ in nature. Some of them are really about providing you with functions that are much shorter in name to make your code tighter, a little easier to code up quickly. Some are more about aesthetics, like YUI, um, and script, or rather like Scriptaculous. Some of them, like YUI and jQuery, actually have both particular elements. So with that teaser tonight, I'll stick around for a bit, but why don't we see you next week when we'll continue.